Welcome to the NCPA. The quality of the arts available to man in his hours of leisure helps to sharpen his faculties and mold the man, wrote Dr. Jamshe Jahangir Baba on the role of arts in nurturing humankind. He believed that arts and all their varied forms help an individual evolve to ultimate refinement. It was this belief that led him to conceive what is now known as the National Center for the Performing Arts. To honor the memory of its founding father, the NCPA launched the Jamshed Bhabha Memorial Lectures on 21st August 2019 on the occasion of Dr. Bhabha's birth anniversary in the organization's Golden Jubilee Year. Welcome to the 2021 edition of the Memorial Lecture. And to mark this auspicious occasion, what could be a more enriching topic than art and mankind explored by a physician whose very definition of medicine marries art and science? A legend in his field, Dr. Farooq Udwadia, was awarded the Padma Bhushan for his contribution to medicine in 1987. But the veneration his patients shower on him stems from his art of listening and empathy, and for these, he turns to art. I now invite Mr. Kushru Santok, Chairman, NCPA, in whom Dr. Baba saw a dear friend and an irreplaceable colleague, and in whose safe hands he left the NCPA to introduce Dr. Udwadia. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The last year and a half have been a gloomy time for the performing arts. I am intrigued by what Dr. Baba's reaction would have been to the present problems confronting us. Last 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when his beloved theater, the Jamshed Baba Theater, named after him, burnt down while almost nearing completion. He called a meeting the very next day when it was possible to enter the theater and calmly announced, no recriminations, we start building tomorrow. I wish he was with us with his indomitable spirit at this time also. The importance of art in our everyday life was keenly understood by him. And what a wonder that Dr. Farooq Udwadia suggested the same subject when he agreed to speak at this memorial lecture on Dr. Baba's birthday today. Art is an essential part of the character of a nation. It defines who we are and how we are perceived, both by our colleagues nationally and internationally. And this essential part of the spirit of these fine men is what makes Dr. Udwadia the ideal person to reflect their beliefs. Dr. Baba, who spoke admiringly of the choice of his doctor and friend, Dr. Farooq Udwadia, and Dr. Ba uh, Udwadia, who in turn admired Dr. Baba for his myriad achievements, certainly made them kindred spirits. Padma Bhushan, Dr. Udwadia's CV requires several pages, but suffice it to say that he emerges from it encrusted with honors, bestowed on him by the very best institutions in his areas of operation and even elsewhere. In spite of his consuming professional schedule, where he wo works, I'm told, nine days a week, his love for other forms of art and craft and his desire for knowledge led him to develop a love of music. The extent of his knowledge on the subject is impressive. 
And therefore, again, the choice of Dr. Udwadia for this lecture is more than appropriate. Today's lecture will be streamed via the electronic medium and viewed all over India and, of course, many parts of the world. I hope people will listen and react to what I'm sure will be an inspirational lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Udwadia. Kindred souls indeed. Thank you, Mr. Santok. Mr. Santok, may I request you to stay on stage and present uh, Dr. Udwadia a token of appreciation? Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Udwadia. Mr. Kushu Santok, Chairman of the National Center of Performing Arts. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, First, let me thank Mr. Santok for inviting me to speak on this auspicious occasion, the birth anniversary of Dr. Jamshid Baba. Jamshid Baba was both a patient and a friend, and I really got to know him quite well over the last eight years of his life. As a person, he was a warm, gentle, person, a joy to be with. I remember with nostalgia the dinners my wife and I were invited to at his home on his terrace. They were really amazing and exciting for more reasons than one. Jamshed Baba was born into an aristocratic Parsi family. And he had the fortune of being taken by his parents to the best music centers in Europe when he was just a schoolboy. That was perhaps one reason, at least, why the love of art, particularly music, was nurtured within him. He then studied in Cambridge and got his tripos in history. Came then, was taken up by the Tatas. He became, in course of time, a director of many, many important companies in the Tata group. He also won a number of accolades, a number of distinctions some can mostly connected with the arts, but some also not connected with the arts. I'm not going to go into that aspect of his life at all. I just want to speak a few words on his great contribution to art and our heritage of art in this city and in our country. He was a visionary. To start with, there was nothing, if I may say so, nothingness. Except the waves of the Arabian Sea lapping the shores of this city, this island city, at Nariman Point particularly. And then his dream slowly began to be realized. Land was reclaimed from the sea 
and it was on this reclaimed land that you see this beautiful structure. He got the best engineers, the best architects, the best individuals who were expert in sound to build this theater. As you see, it is really a thing of beauty, a fan-shaped auditorium where you can see and hear from every seat a rotating stage, a beautiful place for a budding artist to show his talent, a lovely place and a lovely ambiance for both the artist and the audience. You can see here from any seat in this auditorium. There were no microphones. In fact, he would refuse an artist who wanted a microphone saying that the auditorium is so constructed that the sound would carry to any and every seat. So you have the National Center of Performing Arts. Now, this center propagates art for one thing, performs art for another. Equally important is the fact that it has preserved our national heritage so that it is there for all time, for future generations. I'm sure you know that Indian music, for example, has no notation. So how do you preserve the voices, the instrumental uh, uh, virtuosos playing Indian music unless you record it and keep it for posterity? It's not just the art that you see in the city. This center also has preserved folk art around the city and far away from the city as well. And you all realize that Art could not possibly have arisen first in the city. It had to be from the countryside. That's where how the world began. So folk art, folk culture, folk music is also preserved here. Besides the Tata Theatre, you have the Jamshed Baba Theatre. You all know that it was burnt down within a few months of its being completed. It didn't bother him. There were no, no recriminations, no great inquiries. He just set out and said, we'll build it again. And out of the ashes of that burnt theater, like a phoenix, arose the new theater. Of course, most, first of all, there was this little theater, which was, which was recording music, storing music, and also a place to start with for performing all the arts. And there is, of course, the experimental theater for theater, for drama. So you have a visionary whose vision comes true, a dreamer who dreams and who lived his dreams. So now there are many who have great dreams, but very few who live them. Jamshed Baba was one of them. And he then passed his mantle over to Kushfu Santok, who indeed has done extremely well, has expanded the scope and the vista of this national center. The Symphony Orchestra of India was his brainchild, and it has done so well. His remarkable connections with musicians in the West, composers, conductors, virtuosos, has been responsible for allowing the Symphony Orchestra of India to perform at places outside this country, Switzerland, London, the Middle East, etc. Amazingly, he has also streamlined the management. He has also managed to get a huge collection of long playing records, which recorded the voices of great singers of the past in the West, and also a collection of about 10,000 books with a very good library that this center possesses. 
Here is Marat as the music director and Zain Daral who aids him. So there you have it, the center going from one height to the other. Now if Jamshed Baba uh, is not in the, uh, what shall I say, in the Valhalla of music and musicians, he might perhaps be looking down upon us and he would be smiling to see that this good center has progressed markedly under the tutelage of his friend and protege, Kushu Santok. Ladies and gentlemen, the subject of my talk is art and mankind. I would like to introduce this subject with a little bit of artistic fervor. Art is the breath, smiles, and tears of this whole world and of all mankind. Once life began to ascend the evolutionary ladder that made it human, art was there. Art was born. Art exists. The philosopher who studies art sent a questionnaire to many, putting this question to them. How does art differ from anything else? And there were numerous replies to this query, but the one common refrain was that art is made by man, it is man-made, so that you can distinguish it from the beauties of nature, like a beautiful sunrise or a glorious sunset. But I think this is too wide a description of art. I would consider art as that contrived, conceived, and practiced by man, which brings forth, which is evocative of an aesthetic response. This aesthetic response may be good or it may be bad. So we must recognize that there is good art and there is bad art. One often hears sometimes in the same breath the use of the words art and culture. Now, culture is a way of living, of a society, of people, of a country. It is their behavioral attitudes, their aspirations, their customs, their beliefs, their institutions, passed down from one generation to the other. There can be no culture without art. Art is the heartbeat of a culture. What is more, it can transcend the boundaries of a particular culture and go on to other societies, other people, other countries. It is therefore a great communicator. And what does it communicate? It communicates the fine arts, the visual arts, literature, poetry, music, theater, cinema, even photography. And because it is a great communicator, it brings people together. It builds bridges across countries. It is indeed a bridge across many countries, sometimes a bridge over troubled waters. I think art is not only important, but very valuable for mankind. It opens a window to the outer world. Don't forget, art and science are the twin pillars that have marked 
the ascent of man from early history to the present times. In fact, it is the balance between art and science that will determine the future of man and our civilization. Yes, it opens a window to the outside world. It describes beauty. It describes love, joys and sorrows, victories and defeats, splendor and squalor, virtues and vices. It depicts all that is apparent to the eye. It also depicts that which is not apparent to the eye. More importantly, art is the window to the inner world of man. It nourishes his spirit, his stream of consciousness. It enriches his feelings, his senses, his sensibilities. It cultivates his aesthetic sense. And in doing so, he molds you into a better, more civilized human being. Now, humanity lives in time and space. And a great poet has said, the time present is contained in time past and future, and time future contained in time past. So art brings the past into the present. It depicts the present, displays the present, may criticize it, may praise it. It can also predict the future at times. Well, life is a creation. Art also creates, it questions, it answers. It unveils questions hidden in mistruths and lies. It answers those questions and prefers the truth. Man is driven by emotion by intellect and by sexuality. Can you imagine a world with poor emotion, semi-robots robots moving around the world? How sad a world it would be. Now, art nourishes our emotions. It feeds our emotions. And amazingly, it is emotion and feeling that sometimes is responsible for the creation of great art. Therefore, I think, in a way, art has the power to civilize man. When immersed in the rapturous beauty of transcendental art, the world ceases to exist. You lose yourself. You delve deep within yourself, and perchance you may discover yourself anew. That is a great thing, to discover and rediscover yourself. You know yourself better. You know your fellow human beings better. And you are able, perhaps, to withstand the slings and arrows of or outrageous fortune better than you would otherwise do. Now that I've given you a brief idea in general of art and its value to mankind, I must spend some minutes on the art and heritage of our own country. We are a civilization that goes back to 5,000 years, a vibrant civilization. The cultural heritage of this country is second to none. The light of civilization shone on this country when the rest of the world was in bleak darkness, except perhaps for Egypt and China. I do not think that there is any other country which has a greater store of treasures that we possess, visual art, 
literature, poetry, song, dance, music, theatre, rites and rituals, languages. They have now all be termed, been termed the ancient heritage of India. Now, of course, this heritage has to be preserved. It should not be eroded. It should be passionately preserved. I think we should have more museums. Our artifacts should be carefully displayed and carefully preserved. They should not disappear into the museums of other worlds. For this to happen, we need support from the powers that be. Unfortunately, this is a miserly minuscule, but it also needs support from people within this country. I just don't mean financial support. It is important that the people in this country are aware of the importance of art, participate in art, attend functions showing art. But there is a strange apathy people in this country. Look at the number of people visiting museums in London and New York and look at them visiting in this part of the world. What should we do to change this apathy? I'm reminded of a sentence from Dante's great work, The Divine Comedy. It goes, it was at school that I learned to owe Dante to tread the path that was to lead me here. I'm going to take this completely out of reference, out of context from what he meant. But it is at school that we must start teaching our children the importance and value of art. Art should be a subject very much like physics and chemistry, languages, history, geography, mathematics, etc. It should not be a side show, a side issue as it is. It's just not teaching art, but trying to see if you can practice art. Song, theatre, perhaps an instrument, visual art, painting. It is only then when the child matures and treads the path back into the outward world, outer world, Will he learn the importance of art? Will he learn to protect art, propagate art, practice art? Will he learn that art really matters? Now, just because we have a great heritage, does it mean that we shut our eyes to the art and culture of other worlds? No, even if you do so, art is a great communicator. It will come through your shut windows, even if you don't open them. I think we should let the winds of art and culture from all corners of the world go to our heart and homes, our schools and colleges, our universities, our places of learning, even our museums, so that we really enrich ourselves further. We are citizens of India but we are also citizens of the world. Nevertheless, we should ensure that what belongs to us is first and foremost ensconced safely within our hearts. Why should this be so? Because it is art and culture that confirms our identity. What is the future of art? That is a burning question. As you know, technology advances at a furious rate. The cell phone has become an appendage to the hand and an attachment to the ear. It is expanding or going at an exponential rate 
Will it really dominate our life and living more and more as years go by? Will art be thrown into the shadows, into the background? Will it cease to be important? Will it consume mankind? Will it cease to matter? I must quote here a sentence of a great technocrat who was also otherwise a remarkable man, Steve Jobs. This is what he said. It is in the DNA of Apple that technology is not enough. It is technology married to the liberal arts, married to humanities, that will yield results that shall make the heart sing. What a beautiful sentence. Two opposite twins embrace each other, get married, and the heart sings. But what if technology turns around and say, I don't want to marry liberal arts or humanities, go away. Pushed you into the background, what then? Yes, of course, the heart stops to sing. What if ultimately art simply does not matter at all? What then? Perhaps the heart stops altogether. This is a great futuristic question, debated by scientists, by doctors, by technocrats, again and again. We have evolved over millions of years into a species called the Homo sapiens. We have evolved through Darwin's theory of selection and genetic drifts. The technology says that we could evolve in another 500 or at most a thousand years into a different species, more powerful having much more attributes than you at present have. How? He says, well, we can be half machine, half humans. We can even be full machines, and you'll see how far we can go. It will be a different species altogether. Then what happens to art? Remember, at the outside, I said, at the, out, out, at the very first moments that I spoke, I said that art is part of being human. So if you cease to be human, art ceases. Art is no longer there. But would a world which is ruled completely by technology, half human, half machines, almost full machines, have no art? Of course it has to have it. It'll have its own art. It'll have artificial intelligence telling greatly sophisticated instruments to make art, but then it is not the art that we know. Well, now, this is a center for performing arts. I must talk a little about the performing arts. I shall touch upon the visual arts, on literature, on poetry. Perhaps mention dance, cinema, and then dwell a little more on music. Take the visual arts. I love painting. You stand before a great canvas in one of the museums in London and New York, a Matisse or a Picasso or a Rembrandt. Or you look at one of our, the paintings of our homegrown artists, like Souza Raza Hussein. Or you look at a beautiful Indian miniature, so beautiful, so delicate, with fine brush strokes a picture fitted into a space of nine by six inches, an absolute jewel of Indian art. Let's go back to the canvas. You see a beautiful canvas painting. You forget the humdrum of your usual existence. You're wrapped now in a world of color and imagination and sometimes great beauty. What do you do? You look at the colors, the harmony 
or not. You try and find out what the artist means to say, have you seen works like this before of the same artist? How do you, what do you make of them? In other words, you explore the canvas. And when you explore the canvas, without being aware, you're exploring your own self. You know yourself better. It's worth remembering that great canvases do not necessarily express beauty. They may soothe you, but they could also provoke you and shock you. Sometimes they're incomprehensible to you. It takes time learning, teaching from others to understand what they mean. Literature. We have a treasure trove of literature. The Mahabharata and Ramayana were written in 1500 BC, in Sanskrit, of course, and then followed a large number of Sanskrit words, perhaps the most artistic work recognized, mind you, not just in this, this country, but all over the world, is Kalidas's Mehbut. It describes a man who was punished for some reason or the other. He sits on the top of a mountain, and a monsoon cloud hovers above him. He beseeches the monsoon cloud to take a message to his beloved far, far away in the north. The cloud agrees. It goes over hills and dales, streams and rivers, fields and meadows, climbs again into the mountains, and delivers the message. This is the sum and substance of this beautiful, lyrical work. And the modern, more modern people that are closer to our, our, our age, not our age, but to our era, you have Vivekananda, a man who prodigiously gifted with his bold thoughts and his voluminous works, who died at the young age of 38. Rabindranath Tagore, who won his Nobel Prize for Gitanjali, a poet, a writer, an educationist, an artist, a philosopher, all rolled into one. Aurobindo Ghosh, for example, with his great, great work, Savitri, a divine spirit coming into the world as a human being. And then, of course, there is Premchan in Hindi, Kabir in Urdu, sometime in the 16th century, there are the Sufis who sing their paeans to the greatness and love of God. And there is, of course, great literature otherwise, particularly great Tamil literature, 2,000 years at least old, with a treasure trove of great literary works. Literature somehow also is important when you look at the literature of other countries. Tolstoy with his war and peace, a tapestry of life. Dostoevsky, rather Skamarazov, elucidating almost every emotion that a human being can have. Goethe, writing Faust, Schiller, next to him. Hugo and Sartre in France. And of course, numerous English writers in literature, but above them still towers Shakespeare, relevant as much today as he was in his old ancient, as he was in his, in his own time. Literature somehow or the other makes you feel the resilience of the spirit of man. It indirectly tells you there is a divine spark in every human heart. It tells you the force of destiny that rules the lives of many men and women, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. Also, that the forces of good and evil in the outside world are often mirrored in all of us humans. Let me now go on to poetry. I love poetry too. It is the most evocative of the arts, only next to music. Poetry is a song of chosen words. Only you don't sing it, you recite it. 
No author writing prose can ever come up to a poet writing, for example, about duty or love. Rather than speak of poetry, I give you an interlude where I will recite some poetry. Here is Lord Byron talking of beauty of a woman, or versifying on the beauty of a woman. She walks in beauty like the night, of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes. Let's take love. I've chosen part of a love sonnet by a Chilean person writing Spanish poetry. And this is a translation. It loses a lot, lot of its beauty in this translation. I've chosen it because it has an imagery which is, I've never, never, ever seen in English poetry. The first four lines particularly and the last two lines. I love you as certain dark things are to be loved in secret between the shadow and the soul. I love you as the blooming plant that never blooms but has within it the scent of hidden flowers. I love you not knowing how, or where, or when. I love you because I do not know any other way than this, that you do not exist, nor do I. So close that your hand on my chest is mine. So close that your eyes close as I fall asleep. Now, I told you that sometimes art can predict the future. And nobody has predicted it as well as Auden, the English poet. He predicted the Second World War over one and a half years before it actually broke. And this is how he versifies. Living nations wait in sequestrated hate. And the sea of pity lies locked and frozen in each eye. And another verse same by the same poet, which so beautifully applies to the situation we are in today, the curse of this pandemic. This is what he says. In the forming of this verse, make vineyards of that curse. In the deserts of your heart, let easing fountains start. In the prison of your days, teach free man how to praise. In the prison of our days, as it is, teach free man how to praise. I'm thinking of the Italians who leaned out of their windows singing and playing to help their neighbors in distress. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, I've not said one word about death. But then, as you all know, the only certainty in life is death. And I give you some beautiful lines from an American poet, Walt Whitman, a nature poet who lived with nature in nature. I read his Leaves of Grass when I was in my 30s, but this is not from that book. It's a strange thing, isn't it? There are many who says who say they're not afraid of death, but they're afraid of dying. And this is how Walt Whitman wishes not only to die, but dying. I love these lines because of their beauty. I love these lines also because this is exactly the way I would want to leave the world. Listen to these lines. Let me glide effortlessly forth. With the key of softness, open the locks. 
with a whisper, Ope the doors, O soul, tenderly, be not impatient. Great is your hold, O mortal fresh. Great is your hold, O love. Well, I must go back to prose. Let's mention a line about dance. I love the dance, particularly the Indian's dance. Dance is poetry in motion. And I must mention cinema. Cinema is an amalgam of all the arts, visual arts, literature, poetry, music, theater. And all through there runs sometimes in good cinema a beautiful, tender story which makes you smile and happy. Or sometimes a sad, sad story that makes you cry and makes your heart weep. Now let me dwell on music. Music hath the charms to soothe the savage breast, to soften rocks and bend a twisted oak. Music is an inborn entity, feature of the human psyche. It is rooted deep in human nature and is a fundamental attribute and activity of the human species. More people in this world hear music than any time before. You have music on your computer, on your radio, on your television, on your CDs. You have music in temples and churches and subways. You have music in small salons and large auditoriums. You sing music, you hum music, you whistle music, you tap time to music, you clap when it suits you to music. Verily, the world is filled with the sound of music. From the beginning of time, there is no culture which lacks music. Music dates from antiquity as seen in Paleolithic caves, paintings of men and women in groups dancing, and on the floor, bones fashioned so that they could serve as flutes. Amazing, because you know now, that dance and music came around the same time, or around close to each other, if not at the same time. And almost certainly, if music was there, song must, must have been there as well. What is the use of music? Music, they say, the musicologists say, is a great communicator between people, but what does it communicate? It does not alter our conception of the world outside. It does not add to more meaning, information, as for example, the language gives us. Then what does it do? What is its purpose? I'll tell you, Two naive thoughts of two great physicians, of two great music, music, musicians, Daniel Berenboy, for example. He says, I will make music for peace. So he forms the Arab Jewish Orchestra, which goes great places. He plays amongst the Middle Eastern Arabs and amongst the Jews in Israel and amongst Germany and all over the world. And another musicologist who said that I will play music to counter terror, to counter violence. I will play it more intensely, more beautifully, and more devotedly than ever before. Naive thoughts, of course, but what beautiful thoughts 
from individuals who live for music, immersed in music, whose life is music, for music is life. What beautiful thoughts against evil deeds. How did music originate? In our country, all things great and beautiful have the stamp of divinity. They are the gifts of gods to mortal men. And music is one of them. Music is of two kinds, they say. One is the vibrations of ether. Pythagoras called it the music of the spheres. The unstruck sound, if you like, therefore, the sound to mortals, the sound of silence, because though it is the delight of the gods, it is inaudible to mortal men. And the other kind of music, the vibrations in air, the struck sound, that is the music of the world as produced by us, by men. Now, is this unstruck sound related to struck sound? It is widely accepted that sound does not exist on its own, by itself. It has a permanent relation to silence, which precedes it. So that the first sound of a musical composition is not really the first. It emanates from the silence that precedes it, and the last sound is not the last because it again is converted back into silence. So it is possible that the struck sound of man emanates from the unstruck sound of the gods. Call it the music of the spheres. Call it the sound of silence. And then returns back from where it arose. If you look at this metaphysically or metaphorically, and if you extend this analogy to life on earth, it is indeed a beautiful philosophical thought. It is the supreme being who, who controls the world, shall we say, controls the universe, shall we say. It is from him that life emanates, and when life has finished its course, it goes back from where it arose. Now, in the West, of course, they are more logical, and they have numerous, numerous theories of how music began. But they certainly don't appeal to me at all. I think the origin of music will always remain a mystery. But music evolved, mind you, after its origin, from basic simplicity to sophisticated complexity, both Western music and Indian music. And with this evolution, there was also an evolution of the numerous instruments that came into play, both Western music and Indian music. But most people feel, and I too do, that the greatest instrument ever is the human voice. A melodious, far-ranging human voice is the personification of the quintessential beauty of music. I'd like to say just a few words of certain music forms, like, for example, the opera, the grand opera. Why is it grand? Opera dramatizes life. It is a dramatized cross-section of life. In opera, you have beautiful singers singing beautifully, accompanied with music. What do they sing? They sing a story which can be summarized in a few lines. But the story has the potential to give forth emotion and passion. And as the singer sings, he pinpoints an emotion or a passion as it unfolds in the story. And with this beautiful voice and with the beautiful music, it is hurled at the audience and has a great impact. Whereas theater 
is with words. Opera is with song and music. And it is this song and music, loud and clear, perhaps uncensored by the mind, that touches and moves the heart. Jazz, again, a great form of music. Great, great form of music, which I'm beginning to like more and more. It is uh, permutations and combinations on a theme. And there can be endless permutations and combinations. How can we ever forget Louis Armstrong when he came here? His beautiful rendition of Hello Dolly, or How Great Is The World. This beautiful trumpet and the jazz and the music that he produced from his trumpet and his own musical personality, unforgettable. Indian music is a mathematical seven note scale. And you have to be within that seven note scale, but you can have any number of permutations and combinations. The ragas, therefore, played or sung by a musician on one day may be different on the next day because you can have different permutations and combinations. This is what I meant when I said that Indian music has no notation whatsoever. And then you have ragas for the day and the night, for health, for disease, various diseases, etc. Music has a great effect on the mind. All of us have been wired to appreciate music. But imagine the musical wiring in the brain of great virtuosos who know by heart the whole repertoire of their instrument, violin or the piano. Imagine the great, almost impossible to, to, to accept the memory of great conductors who know symphonies, operas, everything in their minds. They don't have to lick the score. It's almost like learning the Encyclopedia Britannica by heart. Some of you must have heard of the Mozart effect. It was an experiment. Mozart played to young children, and it was observed that it had a marked effect on the cognitive function, improving it considerably. And a control group taught similarly, but without playing Mozart. Unfortunately, it happened that after a few months, three, four, five months, the effect disappeared. But what would happen if the children were to listen to music like this, listen to Mozart off and on, every day, every other day, would it improve their cognitive powers for a longer time, permanently? The same is seen with Hindustani music also. The same experiment was performed and the same result, improvement in the cognitive functions of children. It's not just Mozart, it could be any great music, I'm sure. It's a strange effect on the mind reported by Oliver Sacks. It's called musicophilia. I've never seen it. It must be extremely rare. The example of a man who gets down from a train, walks out of the platform to a telephone booth, is struck by lightning, and has a cardiac arrest. He is resuscitated. Probably there was a doctor with him. He recovers completely with no neurological deficit. He's a surgeon. He goes back to work, to surgery in 15 days. Then suddenly now, he has an urge for listening to Western music. He was not musical at all before. And he has an urge to listen to the music of Chopin, particularly played by the virtuoso Astrasia. Then he starts hearing music in his mind. And they said, oh, you are hallucinating. He says, no, I'm not hallucinating. He didn't know how to notate music. So he learns to notate music and notates what he's hearing in his mind. He learns the piano, and within a few months, he, he's quite good at the piano. He plays a couple of scherzos of Chopin. He plays his own composition to great applause. What an amazing. How could this happen? 
possible that numerous interconnections between neurons must have snapped, new connections form. It's just, I mean, it's just hearsay. You really don't know how this came about. It just goes to show that the brain is one part of the human anatomy which is uncharted, about which we have lots and lots more to learn. Of course, there are disturbance in rhythm that one sees in so many people. But the more outstanding example was that of Che Guevara, Guevara the, uh, the, the, um, the associate of Fidel Castro. He knew only the, how to dance the mambo. So when the orchestra played the tango, he would be dancing the mambo. Now, this is sacrilege in Spanish-speaking countries, where tango is almost a religious ritual, that being Che Guevara. It was all right. And finally, a most amazing example, again quoted by the same author, when because of some disease in the brain, a musician mistakes his wife for a hat. It's not that he couldn't see, he could see, but he couldn't understand or interpret what he saw. So he thought his wife was a hat and he spoke to her. But his musicality was not lost. In fact, it was exaggerated. He would sing in his bath, he would sing when he was eating, he would sing when he was working, he was singing all the time. His musical aptitude, his musicality, was his main connection to the world. Otherwise, his emotional life was terribly distorted. Music also helps in medicine. Anxious people, their pulse rate slows, their blood pressure comes down, the stress hormones come down. You use music after surgery, particularly following the war for the wounded. Music was a great boon. Of course, you know you need to choose your music well. I remember a girl who came to me, not a girl, a lady who came to me in her twenties, who said, Doctor, I haven't slept for six weeks. If you can't help me, I shall throw myself out of the window. Believe me, it, I'm quoting her exact words. I said, please don't do that. What have you taken? And he showed me a whole list of drugs, most of which I did not know because my form, pharmacopoeia is rather limited. I didn't know what to give her. So I just said, will you hear this Western classical music piece I give you? She says, no, I only like pop music. I said, please hear this. And I prescribed for her, take thou of Mozart's clarinet concerto. Well, she did it. She comes back after two weeks and tells me, this is a miracle. I have started to sleep again. I've prescribed this music for over 100 people. And I don't think there is one who at least hasn't said that it has to some extent benefited. It doesn't have to be Mozart's clarinet concerto. It could be the andante of Mozart's concerto for the piano in C major. Or it could be the andante of uh, Mahler's Fifth Symphony. Or it could be the second movement of Beethoven's violin concerto. Or it could be Ravi Shankar's sitar. Or it could be the flute of Hari Prasad Chaurasya. Or it could be any music, Indian or Western, which suits and pleases them. Now, we again come to the same question. What is the purpose of music? What is the significance of music? I said it is an innate feature of the human psyche. It, I think, mirrors our inner life. And it is beautifully put by some great philosophers and writers. Bergson, the great philosopher, said that it is a continuous melody that mirrors your inner life. A melody that goes on and on and on till the end of human existence. Wittinson, they say he's probably the greatest philosopher of this age. I tried to read him. I couldn't understand a line. 
But he said this, that after reading Bertrand Russell's Principia Mathematica, he said, this is a really beautiful. The only accolade that I can give it is that it is music. And Lowell, again, another mathematician in his Lowellian lecture, lectures, sorry, it is, I think it was Whittaker in his Lowellian lectures, who said something remarkable. He said that the science of mathematics is perhaps the greatest creation of the human spirit. And the only other claimant is music, mathematics, music. Now, even you and I will understand that the mathematician appreciates the beauty of numbers. The musician appreciates the beauty of tones, tunes, rhythms. Both have this in common. They make linkages of abstractions, patterns out of ideas. My interest in the mathematician Hardy came about because he was with Ramanujan, the greatest mathematical prodigy we've ever had in India. And Hardy said, pure great mathematics has the following principles. It needs to have generality. It needs to have substance. It needs to have inevitability. It needs to have surprise. Surprise, and it needs to have economy. When the musicologists read this, they said, well, this is all that great music has. It has generality. It has to be iconic, not limited to a certain area, but appreciated by, well, many, many people. It has to have substance, otherwise it becomes monotonous or resembles the music of a musical hall. Objection, I would say. Great music has come from musical halls. Great music has come from cinemas. Songs from there, which have touched the hearts of many, many, many more people than those touched by Western classical or Indian classical music. But leave aside that. The next is inevitability. I can't agree more than that. Can you ever imagine Beethoven's Ninth Symphony ever ending in any other way than it does? No. Can you ever imagine his Fifth Symphony ever beginning in any other way than it does? Da 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 da! Fate knocking at the door. Whose door? The door of humanity, of course. So there you have. Music, as I said, is remarkable. Then what is the difference, you will say, between mathematics and music? Well, music has features of mathematics plus magic. And what is its magic? Its magic is its ability to evocate both the intellect and the emotion. And through this ability, it is able to reflect all the aspects of life. Well, I'm, I, have, I have lived amongst death and disease for many years, as quite a number of people like me. I'm not the exception. It has been a wonderful life, of course. But sometimes one is torn by the storm that rages within one for various reasons in your professional work. And I've often sought refuge in the beauty of great music classical, Indian, or Western, chiefly Western, I admit. And then I feel sometimes there is indeed another world besides the one we inhabit.
that I may die and everyone dies, but the spirit is endless, birthless, deathless, infinite. Sometimes great music, sometimes, occasionally, I admit, it makes me commune with my inner stream of consciousness. And then life has a greater meaning. A transcendental blessing that enriches, ennobles, and enhances the human spirit. I must now speak a little on creative art. Great art stems from creativity. Creativity doesn't rise from nothingness. It is not a figment of imagination, just an invention. Creativity lies from the experiences that an artist has in his life, the experiences that the world thrusts upon him, sometimes agonizing, painful. It is these cumulative experiences buried deep down in his subconscious state that is the source of artistic creativity. But we all, as we grow older, have some suffering, some pain, many experiences. Why are we not artists? Why are, at least are there not many great artists amongst us? This is because the artist is different. He looks at the world differently. He looks at the world as the world is not. He thinks deeply. He feels intensely. He imagines vividly. He has the ability to go deep down in his subconscious state and draw forth hidden experiences, hidden emotions rather, from buried experiences, bringing them up to the conscious level and transmuting them into great art. It is feeling rather than intellect that makes him transport these experiences, transform these experiences, and transcribe reality so as to reach a point beyond it. How does this happen? What is the genesis? No one knows. Is it congenital, perhaps? Is it done through practice over years? I don't know. Is it just plain genius? Wolfgang Amandius Mozart composed at the age of six years. What experiences could you say he had at this age, either overt or hidden? You know, to me, I think indeed he's, he's a great composer, beautiful composer, beautiful music. I can't help feeling, you know, that whereas most artists will create have creativity in them to create art or create music. I somehow feel that in music, in Mozart, the music is just already created there, already there, waiting there. He just has to put his fingers on the keyboard and the music flows. It happens, just happens. Does suffering affect creativity? Yes, of course it does. Sometimes it completely snuffs off creativity. Sometimes it ignites the flame of genius. A not very well-known poet, I forget the name, who had big swings of depression and big springs of extreme enthusiasm. She killed herself ultimately after a fit of depression. And she wrote beautiful four lines, nothing great, but somehow they are etched in my mind. My candle burns at both ends. I know it will not last the night. But ah, my foes, and oh, my friends, it gives a lovely light. Edna St. Vincent Millay, that was the name of this lady poet, it suddenly comes to me. 
And then, of course, think of Vincent van Gogh. In his madness towards the end of his life, what great, inimitable art he produced. You stand transfixed before some of these paintings. It is as if he had dipped his paintbrush into his very being, into his soul, and splashed it across the canvas for the world to see. Think of Beethoven, totally stone deaf, when he composed his greatest music, the Ninth Symphony, and the quartets, his last quartets. How could he have done that? What did suffering have to do? to do with it. Mustn't he have been suffering? I can't have a feeling that he was totally deaf to music. Perhaps he could see sound. Perhaps, who knows? He could see sound. He could see notes. Perhaps not with his eyes, but with his inner eye. Perhaps the greatest example of suffering which has ignited great genius is the philosopher Nietzsche. Nietzsche one of the founders of modern philosophy. He was riddled with disease, every disease you can imagine. He was mentally unsound, extreme depression, and suddenly he becomes inspired. And he writes what is, mean, what is meant by inspiration. And even in the translation from German to English, makes an excellent reading. And then he comes forth with his greatest work ever, Thus Spake Zarathustra. And he says, Sing and bubble over, O Zarathustra. Teach your soul to learn new songs so that you can bear your great destiny. You are the teacher of eternal recurrence. And he goes on further to say, O man, attend. What does deep midnight's voice contend? I have slept my sleep. And? And awakening now at dreaming's end. The world is deeper, deeper than day can comprehend. Deep is its woe. Joy deeper than its heart's agony. Woe says, fade, go. Joy says, I want eternity. Want deep, deep Deep eternity. That's how it is, ladies and gentlemen. The heart can never sing forever. There is woe behind joy. And even though joy wants to be happy, joy wants to be happy, make people happy, always, always for eternity. Woe says, fade, go. What a way to express the duality first preached by the great Zarathustra 1,500 years before Christ. Why do I bring philosophy into art? Because this is philosophy wrapped in beautiful poetry. Also because all humanities have the thread of art running through them, not just philosophy. History too, and of course religion. All great religious thoughts have been written down in great literature, as great, great literature, starting from the Bhagavad Gita, the Bible, the Quran, the Gathas, the Torah, the, the religious books of the Sikhs, of the Jains, the Buddhists, all great literature. I must conclude. What does art do now for mankind? Remember the Sufi saying, if I had two loaves of bread, I would sell one and buy hyacinths to feed my soul. That's what it does. It makes a human being more human adds a humaneness to his humanity. There is more humanity. Humanitas was the symbol of the Italian Renaissance in the 15th and the 16th century. And what happens 
if art makes you more human, more humane, have more humanity. And it makes you more loving. It makes you more forgiving. It makes you more empathic. And above all, it makes you more caring. That is the word. Caring. Of course, you care for your own self. Of course, you care more for your family even than for your own self. You care for my patients. I care for my patients. But what about others around? Would you dare say that you care for everyone, for all humans, for humanity, for mankind? What a utopian dream. But man loves to dream. Would the utopian dream be utopian for thousands of years? Or would the utopian dream perhaps come true in many, many years to come? One doesn't know. I bit feel very, I feel it difficult to express my thoughts properly in words on this issue. So I shall let this mystic poet who lived many hundred years before us speak for me. Every man's death diminishes me. For I am concerned with mankind. So send not to ask for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. May the winds of art and culture indeed sweep through our lights. Thank you for your enlightening insights, Dr. Udwadia. The words of the then Prime Minister, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, spoken at the inauguration of this very theater come to mind. There can be no civilization without music, dance, and art, for one isn't vibrantly alive without them. May I now request renowned lawyer, champion of urban planning, conservation, and history, an eminent council member of the NCPA, Ms. Shirin Barucha, to propose a vote of thanks to our distinguished speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure and my privilege to propose a vote of thanks for the second Jamshed Baba Memorial Lecture. Dr. Baba was a visionary, a dreamer, who lived his dream and a perfectionist who did not sacrifice practicality. He brought through this institution he created, the NCPA, the world's heritage of the performing arts to our doorstep. It is given only to a choice few to leave a legacy of which nameless generations to come will be the beneficiaries. We remember him <clears throat> on his 107th birth anniversary. It fell to Kushru Santok, a close friend and colleague of Dr. Baba, to enrich and translate Dr. Baba's dream into a reality with the help of his dedicated staff, making the NCPA a world-class institution in this digital age, albeit in the midst of a raging pandemic. It is, as all living institutions are, a work in progress. Our deep thanks go to Dr. Farooq Udwadia, Dr. Baba's physician and friend for delivering this insightful talk on art and mankind. We need constant reminding of the albeit necessity, abide, sorry, abiding necessity of art and aesthetics in today's rushed and at times materialistic world. That art in its many ramifications is and has and has always been the very breath and heartbeat of our lives, without which our existences would be sterile and hollow. He makes a compelling case for the preservation of the arts, for a meaningful life, and on another occasion, for many more NCPAs in our country, through which the winds of art and culture can blow to make the heart sing. 
to have come to have this come about, I think we would need to create clones of Dr. Baba and Kushu Santok. Perhaps Dr. Udwadia can help us in out here. Our thanks again to Farooq for sparing his very valuable time for us on this very special occasion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barucha. And this brings us to the end of this wonderful program. Thank you all for joining us for the second Jamshed Baba Memorial Lecture. We look forward to welcoming you at the NCPA for the 2022 edition. Thank you once again. <laughs>